<laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you so kindly for joining us. Can I just do a sound check? Can everyone in the back hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you so kindly. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Green Apple Books on the Park. We're here tonight celebrating the release of Andrew Leland's book, The Country of the Blind, a memoir at the end of sight. Andrew is joined tonight by Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Let's give a hand for both of them. This is a very packed house, and it's very exciting. I can't believe you all chose to spend your Friday evening with us. Um, but of course, you're here to celebrate Andrew, and that is not a surprise to me. So thank you all so much for joining us. My, my name is Carr Johnson. I'm the event coordinator for Green Apple. Um, just a description, I'm a non-binary person with uh, chin-length hair. I'm wearing a black jumpsuit and a striped shirt, not unlike a mime. And I... <laughs> And I have a backdrop behind me that says Green Apple Books on the Park. Uh, I appreciate you all joining us both in person and online. Hello, online audience. We're broadcasting from San Francisco. We're on Ramatush Ohlone land. And we hope that you join us in our pledge to turn land acknowledgement into action by donating either your time or monetary means to an indigenous organization every time you hear, or in my case, speak a land acknowledgement. Uh, I have very brief business before we get to the fun part of the evening. First, uh, now is a good time to silence your cell phones if you have not already. Um, please do check out our full event calendar on our website at greenapplebooks.com. We have a really great season ahead of us, including the event that you are at right now. Um, and it, it's very exciting. Uh, we have a really good, a good summer coming up. Uh, the restroom is behind us. It is available after the event and not during the event for obvious reasons. Um, we, we like to um, keep it for people attending our event at event time, uh, just because it's the one space that is uh, off the sales floor away from our uh, or excuse me, like separate uh, for our colleagues and we like to give them a little bit of space and uh, we want to respect that. So thank you for being cool about it. We appreciate it. Uh, we have books from both of our authors available at the front. You can find them there. Uh, and I think uh, if, if you ask politely, uh, they can inscribe them for you at the end of the evening. If you've been here before, you've definitely heard me say that when you buy books, from us, not only do you support us as an independent bookstore, uh, you also support the authors who put so much work into making these books, and then you get to have a book, which might be the best part. So if you're able, we always appreciate it. Thank you so kindly. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the two authors that are joining us. First, Ingrid Rojas Contreras was born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Her memoir, The Man Who Could Move Clouds, was a Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award finalist. It was named a Best Book of the Year by Time, People, NPR, Vanity Fair, Boston Globe, and others. And her first novel, Fruit of the Drunken Tree, was a silver medal winner in the first fiction from the California Book Awards and the New York Times Editor's Choice. Her essays and short stories have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Cut, Ziziba, and many other places. She lives in California, and she is a, a friend to Green Apple Books. Uh, please welcome Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Thank you. Uh, and last but most certainly not least, Andrew Leland's writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker, Nick Sweeney's, and the San Francisco Chronicle, as well as Art in America, among many other outlets. From 2013 to 2019, he hosted and produced The Organist, an arts and culture podcast for KCRW. He's also produced pieces for Radio Lab and 99% Invisible. He's been an editor at The Believer since 2003. He lives in Western Massachusetts with his wife and son, and he's visiting us here in San Francisco. His book, The Country of the Blind, is the reason we are here tonight. Let's give a hand for Andrew Lincoln. Uh, thank you, Carr, and hello, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy that you're with us tonight, and hello, Andrew. Hello. Um, I'm very excited that we get to, to talk about um, this book. Um, so how would you how would you describe this book? I don't know if there, there are um, audience members who haven't gotten a chance yet to, to read it. How would you describe it to them? Um, it is a memoir. You know, it's got the word memoir on the cover, and there is a lot about me and my life in it. But I 
Um, just made eye contact with Anna Carollo and totally disarmed me. Hi, Anna. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, from the very beginning, I didn't want to write a memoir alone. And, and not just in like a formal literary decision way, but also because as I lost vision, I, um, I felt a kind of imperative to learn about blindness mm. and understand the process I was going through and like the, the condition that I was presently experiencing and the condition that I anticipated experiencing. And so the memoir is shot through with a lot of history and reporting and, you know, even like, I don't know if criticism is the right word, but I tried to like bring in other genres to the rescue, not only to the book, but also um, to, to my own journey. Mm. I'm glad um, you said all that. My my first question had to do with this is your first book, and I wondered if you know writing a book is already you know a sort of terrifying prospect already, yeah. and then writing memoir is a particularly you know terrifying prospect. Yeah. Um, was it was it like that for you? Um, there were definitely terrifying aspects, um, but I think. You know, I worked as a magazine editor for a long time at mm-hmm. The Believer, and, and, and I think I really internalized a lot of the, like, editorial vibes of the magazine, which is to say, like, The Believer had published essays that often were written in the first person, but then would um, always push past the memoiristic or the personal narrative to find their way into other genres and other territory. Like, my favorite essays that we published were ones that would, like, you know, hook you with with the writer's voice and the writer's life, and suddenly you would wake up and you're in like art history land. And um, and so I think that felt really exciting to me to try my hand at that. I think the terrifying parts were really like, frankly, and I think she's watching the live stream. Uh, hi, Lily. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like the like the, the writing about my marriage, yeah. I think was the scariest part. But also, um, you know, in the spirit of the book, like I was doing it to write a book, but also like writing the book helped us through personally stuff. So, you know, mm-hmm. like, like there was, there was a lot of uh, utility for myself as a person, not to mention as a writer to, to, to really take risks with the memoir part. Yeah. I, I feel that when, when we write a book, oftentimes we are, we go there to discover something that's external. And then in some ways, you know, the book ends up teaching you something or you end up kind of growing up with, with the book. Um, I wonder, you you know, memoirists, you know, think about this a lot. Like, how do you write about someone who's close to you? And, you know, what are the, did you show Lily the, what was the kind of process like? Yeah, I mean, it was really, I guess the word is iterative. Like, there was conversations before I ever wrote anything that were, you know, kind of broad. And then, you know, there were moments where I was kind of like, I think I'm going to write about this and this specifically. You know, and then, of course, there's actual, like, text to, to offer her mm-hmm. and you know down to the very end where I kind of said to her like okay I think that now like I'm not allowed to make like this is our last chance to make any substantive changes before Penguin is going to like you know kill me if I do anything more right and so we like I remember we sat down together and just did a search for her name mm-hmm. uh, and then each time it stopped at her name we would like read the general paragraph and have a conversation and there were some times where she and it kind of got you know her name was mentioned many many times mm-hmm. and so we kind of got into this rhythm of like fine you know lily fine lily and then we would be like okay wait and then there would be a, sometimes a long conversation there and she's an english professor um yeah. and so there was something really fun and also scary about that because she you know she's good with text and so it wasn't just like hello my wife like how do you feel about this but there was like a kind of intense critical wrangling that was going on mm. there too and not to mention that like the stuff we were wrangling about was stuff that we're wrangling about beyond the book as well so there was like a hyper meta wrangle that was going on there. <laughs> I love that um yeah you're much I I don't do what you do I just kind of um have a conversation you know say what's in it um almost no one gets to see the draft until it's you know after but i but i do kind of get an oral like i'm saying this and this specifically and this is kind of the tone i wouldn't do that with anyone other than the person i'm married to i think you know like everybody else i kind of treat a little bit like like a like a magazine fact checker would you know like Mm -hmm. which i think is what you're describing like just making sure that the gist is okay but it gets risky to actually show somebody a sentence because then mm-hmm. they start being like that comma hurts my feelings you know and then mm-hmm. it's a disaster but with yeah. Lily like Lily I just owed that to her you know yeah. like she, she deserved it 
Um, so, so this is yeah a, a beautiful memoir as you were describing it. Um, we we learn about you know history, um, and there was uh, you write in the book uh, that the experience of blindness encompasses both tragedy and beauty, the apocalyptic and the commonplace, terror and calm. Um, and I wondered how you you know in the in the writing of it how you approach getting those tenors in the in the book. Um, I was also thinking, you know, for for myself and, you know, when I'm writing about, for example, traumatic experiences, the, the reader will expect it to sound a certain way. And it's it's always, um, you know, part of the craft becomes like, how do you find or how do you kind of put the humor within the tragedy that happened? Or how do you kind of um, give it different tenors so that it has a of like a larger or you know a truer human experience hmm. i think it's that question is tricky because i think blindness itself for me and i think for a lot of people like like does encompass both registers um and there i don't know um how to answer that i think i think that I was going through a kind of transition or transformation as I wrote the book. And I think I wanted, it's a hard thing to do, but I think I tried to represent that, that ambivalence and that mm. like of not being certain in mm -hmm. the book itself. And so sometimes that means just like I'm contradicting myself, I guess, but, but I think it felt more exciting to me, like even to have the contradiction be within the span of a single sentence, I guess. And like, you know, for example, being afraid of, or like, feeling alienated from blind people at the same time that I feel deeply connected to them, you know, and I think that that is an experience that other people have had too, you know, or being afraid of, of what's coming, but then also being really like energized by it. Mm. And I guess like, it's kind of, it's interesting because your question is almost like aesthetic also, like how do you like paint right. those colors? And uh, I guess, I guess for me, yeah, like I, I started using a screen reader, um, like kind of halfway through writing the book, like I would just start to listen to it, read it back to me while I also looked at it magnified on the screen. And, you know, any writer, I think, is like constantly rereading every sentence and every page. Um, but it became this intense experience of like re-listening over and over again to the point now where like I think any writer, I, I, I wonder if you have this experience with your book, like we could just like read a sentence from your book and you would kind of like roughly know where it is and yeah. how you how it emerged. Yeah, but I, I could probably, yeah, find it and, yeah. Yeah, and so I definitely, I think, yeah, every writer has that, but there's some, like, weird oral thing there where there's, like, a amplified echo chamber from listening mm -hmm. to it so much, but I just think it was, like, any writer maybe, like, reading it a million times until every sentence kind of felt like it was doing what it was supposed to and reflecting how I felt about whatever yeah. it was about. Um, I I have a practice of using the, the computer voice, read mm. my work back to me, mm. And I choose, it's like a, a white American woman, I think her name is Nancy. <laughs> um, and, and if I change the voice and I just can't do it anymore, like huh. it just has to be her voice. Yeah. Did you, did you get to choose a voice or is it just... I did, okay. yeah. I mean... What did you choose? Um, well, so I, uh, the reason, well, okay, so I started out using my Mac and like whatever the white American guy default. There's definitely people in the audience who know. I think it's Alex. Alex, um, I think it's Alex. Yeah. Uh, and then for like boring, but maybe not boring, like accessibility reasons, like I started to need to use, I wasn't using Microsoft Word because I was just like on my own so I could use like the bespoke artisanal uh, mm -hmm. single origin software that I liked. But then uh, I, I was like writing for different editors more who were giving me track changes and I needed to be in Word. And then I discovered that Word on the Mac with a screen reader is not that fun or usable even, or like is breaking every time they do an update. And then I was just like, you know, already immersed in these sort of like various online blind communities. And then most people are in on the, on Windows uh, with PC. This is a long dorky answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. Okay, okay. Um, so I bought myself a, a Lenovo and, um, and, and started using Word and it worked much better with a screen reader, with a screen reader called Jaws. And um, the default, voice for Jaws is called Eloquence. Mm -hmm. And it is like, when Lily heard it for the first time, she was like, what is that like Soviet robot doing in our kitchen? <laughs> I mean, I sort of don't even get to do an impression, you can sort of get the idea. Um, and I was sort of like, oh yeah, I should go back to like something more Alex-like, you know, yeah. that sounds, but then the thing I realized, and I, and I think I learned this from other blind people, is that like that Soviet robotness, it's kind of like maybe you're white American lady, like yeah. it's just sort of like, 
becomes invisible in a way that like if it was something more personable like then my writing voice gets absorbed into that other personality but it just felt so like like ignorable in a way after a time it's just like oh my this is a computer talking it's not it doesn't have any inflection or anything I mean, it has inflection but it doesn't have inflection that had meaning for me in the way others did so I'm, I'm, I'm all in on eloquence. Yeah, I really love the, the lack of inflection is really nice when I'm listening to the work because I think I can, I've, I've heard of writers who sometimes will change the font to an ugly font so that they can really see, you know, all of the text. So I, I love the robot voice for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, I think at some point I found uh, a British man and that was fun, and I was like, this is kind of social justice, because, you know, um, I'm Colombian, and, you know, he's, you know, the robot, the British robot is colonizer, I don't know. Um, but I went back to, to Nancy. Mm. Um, I loved reading about the, the you, you write so much about technologies and, and um, subcultures and histories, and I just was so curious about how you go about research and um, how the research starts to, to inform what you're writing. Hmm. Um, I mean, I, when, I, when I started writing the book, like I hadn't, I was really, I'd only ever really worked as an editor and like the writing that I'd done, I'd done like a couple book reviews and like maybe, I, you know, I've done this podcast, but like I really didn't feel like I knew what being a journalist was or, but I had, I had you know, I was immersed in that world enough, but I hadn't done it myself. And so I think my approach was really just like, try really hard for a really long time until good stuff happens, right? It's a terrible answer to your question. But like, I think, you know, I think I, I think about the writing process and like the research process really as like a, like a metabolizing, like, like you just have to consume a lot. And so I would just like read all the books I could find, but then also like go into scholarly land, but then also go on to like message boards, you know, and like really try to like get the gamut of like, like what is the landscape out there? And then, and then process it you know it's like having enough time to be like okay i'm going to read all those message boards and the books and the articles and then just sort of try to write and then as i do you know then you get a sense of what's important and what i need to read more of um and there's like a metaphor that i use early on in the book where when i was doing sleep shade training mm -hmm. um which is which is really important for um learning blindness skills because you know like i think it's only 15 percent of blind people have no light perception and so like the, for the majority of blind people like sleep shade training is useful because you know you learn to do things non-visually anyway so i was doing that and like exploring this training center with my cane um I, it was this really interesting experience of like you know, go into a room and it's like and i was super overwhelmed but then after a while it's like okay there's like a bunch of folding chairs in like the left corner and to the right like you can hear the hum of the refrigerator and like after a couple of days in that space, I was like totally comfortable and like I wasn't even really conscious of wearing sleep shades. I was just like, mm. I'm gonna go find the refrigerator and get my soda or whatever. And like research feels like that way to me too, where like mm. I start out on something and I'm like, oh God, like I have no idea where I am and like uh, probably somebody's gonna cancel me and like write a bad <laughs> review and like I don't know what's going on. And, you know, and then after a while you're like, Refri refrigerator's over there, you know, like <laughs> folding chairs over here and you kind of get a sense of what you need to do and where, mm. where to go. I love that. I love how that illustrates that the the initial fear and the way that you sort of um, yeah wake up to the to the room that you're in and start to know what it is. Um, I wanted to read um, this part in the in the book um, that because I think um, it's just I loved getting to this part because I think it's you know one of the first parts in the book where there's a true sense of finding community or like the joy of finding community. Um, so this is second chapter at the beginning. Um, okay. As soon as I passed through the sliding doors of the convention center, everyone was blind. A blind, blind child was nestled in his sighted mother's arms, asleep or just taking refuge in her neck, his short white cane dangling from his hand. A nuclear family in brightly colored vacation wear walked past, blind parents guided by their two-sided children. A pair of hotel employees stood guard over the place where a guide, guide dog had had an accident, protecting the crowd from flowing into it. The National Federation of the Blinds National Convention draws more than 3,000 attendees a year, nearly all of them blind. I kept repeating this number to myself and in messages to friends. I'm hanging out with 3,000 blind people in Florida. It was such a novelty. Blindness was a group activity. The sounds of dozens of canes tapping on the tiled floors echoed through the lobby. And I just think it's such a beautiful 
scene of just both the, I think just the joy is kind of palpable in, in the scene that, that I just read. Like you can, and especially like ending with that, with like the, the all of the sounds of, of the canes. Mm -hmm. And um, I love how you, how you brought us into the room. Um, and earlier you were, you were talking a little bit about, um, you know, being both on the outside and the inside of the, of the community. Yeah. Um, do you want to say a little bit more about that and maybe what, yeah, the, maybe the, the complications of, of community? Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, that, you know, people had told me that the NFB National Convention was like a really important place to go and was going to blow my mind. And, you know, that, that description, that really is like my first moment there. And I, I got totally overwhelmed with emotion and I, would, I really did not see it coming. I was like, Mr. Journalist guy, you know, and like, sure, I had a cane, but like, and, and, uh, and I didn't know why I was overwhelmed with emotion. And, and, um, but it was really like, I had to like, kind of like pull over to the side and like, just sort of like, collect myself. And, and I think what I realized was that I just had felt alone in blindness without realizing it. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, and it was just, it was like this thing that was happening that I was dealing with, and I was kind of powering through and there was like, my family and my friends, but like, there were no other blind people involved. And, and the only blindness that I kind of knew was like the, these weird cultural received, you know, there was like Mr. Magoo or Homer or whatever, you know, and it's just, and suddenly it was like, oh, like the, the Rosen Center Orlando is like, there's a lot of blind people. And, and then, yeah. And like, you know, my, I hadn't had a couple of encounters with blind folks and like, you know, blind groups before that, but like, yeah, that that had those have been more alienated alienating experiences, and and that it just felt like it was on such a large scale that like it couldn't I couldn't judge it in the same way that I could judge like a group of six blind people, you know, because it was like there's this whole universe out here, and, cl and clearly many of these people are going to be folks who uh, can offer me something, and um, but but again, like you know, that was not like a a transformation that I had, and then from then on, I joined the NFB and was just like had blind friends, and it was all good, right? I kept on like penduluming back and forth with that. And, and I think part of the problem, not a problem, but like a challenge that I still wrestle with is just like the the, the vision that I have, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, I have like, I don't know how many, like six degrees of, of central vision that's pretty usable. And so I just feel this like, you know, this remove. And last night I was having dinner with um, Brian Bashan who ran the San Francisco Lighthouse for a long time. And like, I'm sure he had said this exact, I had asked the exact question to him before he gave me the exact mm -hmm. answer, but it's like, I'm obsessed with it. And I ask again and again, and you know, I'm like, I'm doing this event at Green Apple tomorrow and like I'm going to walk in there and I'm going to be able to like see my friends and people are going to see me seeing my friends and like here I am Mr. <laughs> Blindness and like you know and he was like look like you know Kathy Kudlick who um, uh, taught at SF State for a long time as a blind historian you know she asked the same question of someone and and the answer she got was sort of the answer he gave me which is like you know okay so you bust out your magnifying glass when you're in a bookstore to read something like that magnifying glass is it's just a little tiny white cane and like mm -hmm. you're you're part of the club, you know, and it does, you don't have to be totally blind to be part of this club. And uh, that's a really generous, but also I think true and important way to look at it. And, mm -hmm. but like a lot of these things, like it's just an ongoing process. And like, I can say that to you with great confidence. And then like this, after, later this evening, I'll probably, you know, doubt myself again. And so mm -hmm. I think that thing about community is interesting because I think people do tend to, tend to think of it in binary terms. Like you get in the club and you're good, but there's this constant negotiation within yourself and with others to, to figure out your place in it. Yeah, um, I, I, I got the sense too in that book of exactly what you're saying, um, that yeah, sometimes we, yeah, community isn't as as easy or as, as simple as that. Um, there's, a, there's another part um, where there's another part that I really loved where you were talking about the the joy of um, learning to, to read Braille. Mm. Um, and um, I also, you know, in reading the book, you, you mentioned a lot of the other um, technologies that, that blind people were were using, or I don't know if you'd call them technologies. Yeah, for but, sure. Okay. Um, the Victophone and the other... Oh, yeah, the Optophone. Optophone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and I went on this, you know you know, just rabbit trail of just finding old videos of, mm. and, and seeing how they work and just, yeah, it was all very fascinating. Um, but, um, yeah, there's another, I wanted to read some of that section too. Um, 
Learning Braille felt like becoming literate all over again. At first, I labored over two and three letter words, averting my eyes so I wouldn't be tempted to learn visually. And the dots felt like a raw mash under my fingers. Then gradually, the sensations in my index finger began to resolve themselves into letters, which slowly aggregated into words. I'd only learned the first seven letters of the alphabet, and each new word I read felt like a revelation. I read a B, then an E, expecting more letters, but my finger ran on smoothly into space, like Wild E, Coyote, running off the cliff. Oh, that's it, then B. As soon as I deciphered it, the word lit up on the marquee of my mind's eye. I spent a while deciphering edge. All the letters of the word seemed nestled and pressed together, in the beginning, I had difficulty determining where one braille cell ended and the next began. It's much easier for the eyes to make such fine distinctions than it is for the fingers. My fingers' own edges buzzed with the friction of practice. Barbara Luz was right. I was pressing too hard, and I couldn't help but read too deeply into these first words of my life as a braille reader. Even with seven letters, they still sent powerful messages. Cage. What cage could the author of this textbook possibly be describing but a mental one that have written, quote, the prison house of consciousness if they'd had more letters to work with? Longer words brought the pleasure of achievement. I cheered inwardly as I carefully decoded decayed and cabbage. <laughs> and this is another just beautiful passage of, um, I think uh, later in, in the book, you're 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 noticing that there's there's something changing in you with with you know blindness, and that it's kind of a, a patience or a sort of joy of you know finding a different you know joy in a different way of doing something. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, th thank you for all of that. I, I want to you know since you bring up Braille and technology, I just want to name that like we're super privileged in the house to have uh, Robert Engelbretson and Josh Mealy, who are like. I don't know, I just think, and they're sitting next to each other, it's like, Braille and technology, like the two gods of those two worlds. Uh, uh, so just, you know, delighted that you guys are here. Uh, and they're both in the book. Um, um, but, but your question about about the sort of patience that... Mm -hmm. um, just the way that you kind of saw yourself change. I think now change for everyone is often very difficult, and we always approach change as something to, to be afraid of, or, you know, something that we're... Um, yeah, uncomfortable with. And then when we're in it, there's something that opens in that experience. Um, and I think in the book, what I, what I was noticing was the sort of patience, but also like a, a joy in, in doing something differently. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think like, you know, my shout out to my dad, who is also here. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, he taught me was to meditate and like, you know, them like reading about meditation I think there's like a parallel with writing too, where it's just like the thing you want is curiosity rather than, uh, I mean, I think you're just like the power of curiosity, like being, being, instead of being like, oh, you know, these thoughts suck or like my life sucks, you know, just to be like, let's think about it for a second. Let's look at it. Let's sit with it. Let's uh, be curious about it. And then, you know, I think that can sound kind of pat, but I just, in my experience as a writer, but also just as a human being, um, it's a very effective way to deal with stuff. Um, and so I think, yeah, and I think they go hand in hand they, they, uh, to like be curious about something and to write about it and to research it and to like spend three years kind of like marinating in it is a way to like be curious about it. Um, and that's, that's been helpful. I, I mean, the patience thing is like, you know, it's funny, I, you know, cause I, I write a little bit about mindfulness in the book and I was interviewed by a blind, um, a blind guy who runs a uh, he actually does like the screaming right his jaws. It's like the Jaws Freedom Scientific podcast, mm -hmm. and it was funny because he he latched onto that part and he was like, "I've been blind my whole life. Like blindness is not mindful. You know, like <laughs> I'm just a dude. Like I'm not a mind like blind mindful guy." And it was a really nice like, corrective uh, to me being like, you know, ah, as I like you know patiently feel around. You know, he's just, like yeah. whatever. Like I'm just living my life. Um, but like you know, in my defense, like there is, I think particularly the experience of becoming blind. Um, you know, you do have to, re, you know, like, I'm not going to be able to get across town as quickly necessarily, right? Or if I, like, I'm cooking something, there are, like, s extra steps to take. Um, but I think, like, there is joy to be found in that yeah. different pace. And I've noticed um, a lot of people, whether they're celebrated uh, podcast hosts or just friends and family who kind of are skeptical of that assertion, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, but you'd rather it'd be better if it was faster, right? And I think, like, you know, maybe in some context, but not always. And, you know, and there's like a whole 
body of literature like about this idea of crip time mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily identify as a, as crip but like you know I think that's a really powerful idea that mm -hmm. like it's 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 not it's not lesser it's not a diminishment it's just like you're on a different schedule different clock yeah, yeah and I wonder too if it's if it's something if it has to do with surrender like the moment that you yeah. surrender to something then that's when something new can come from that mm. yeah definitely I mean I think that that idea is really important particularly for people in my position where you know like i that that sort of like metaphysical question of like when do i become blind right because if i wait to become blind until i have no light perception left like i might be it might be waiting a really long time and but but the like the disaster comes when i say well I'm not blind so i'm going to continue doing everything the way i already did and then as a result like that's the slowness that is actually that actually is a problem because like I refuse to use a screen reader because I'm not blind, but then like my eyes completely burn out because I, they fatigue much more easily and I can't finish the book, right? I mean, I don't think I would have been able to finish this book without starting to use a screen reader. Or the same thing, like there's people, you know, and, I, and all like compassion for these people because I'm, I'm one of them and I was one of them, but like, you know, the cane is such a lightning bolt, lightning rod for stigma. You know, mm -hmm. the minute you bring it out, people look at you funny. Uh, but without it, like, I'm hip-checking toddlers to the ground and, like, <laughs> kicking, kicking poodles and, you know, tripping over curbs and breaking things. So, like, you know, I need that thing, even as I feel like a fraud using it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I feel one of the important things that, that this book is doing and that we need is that it's maybe widening the, spe the spectrum of what we understand. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there's... The, maybe there is, yeah, that when, whenever we have a binary definition of something, there, we always seem to run into, into problems. And the reality is always that people's experiences are not in one extreme or the other. Yeah. You know, not everyone is there. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah so I, I really appreciate um, the book and, you know, for what, for what it's doing in Thank that regard. You. Yeah, I mean, there was a really wonderful moment, I think, last week. Um, where like in the span of 24 hours, I had like three different trans friends send me messages being like, my experience of like, I don't know exactly, you know, three different people said it three different ways, but like, the, you know, if I could summarize it, it was kind of yeah. like, this is a book about transition mm -hmm. and that speaks to my experience of transition. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what that analogy, like I think part of what exists in that connective tissue is what you're saying that like, it's not just like, like, I was this way and now I'm this way. Like there is this sort of fluid back and forth or like ambiguity that, that happens. Yeah. And that could be happening for decades. Yeah. Um, I wonder too, were there, were there books that you were reading as you were writing your own or as you were writing this one, was there something that you were, or like a book or an author that you were maybe looking back to? Hmm. Um, yeah, that maybe had done something that echoed or yeah in some ways kind of guided you yeah i mean i think like two books immediately come to mind and like one is like a angel and the other one's a demon kind mm -hmm. of uh i was just having lunch um with robert engelbretson uh this afternoon and we were uh, and, and another uh blind um scholar named eric harvey and we were all talking about john hull's book um um there's two versions of it but touching the rock um hull was an australian theologian who went blind <clears throat> in, in middle age and recorded cassette diaries um, of his experience, like right in the sort of thick of like his, the beginning of his blindness. And, um, um, uh, and it's just like, a like reading it just gave me panic attacks and mm -hmm. it was like a night, it was like a horror novel, mm -hmm. but it was also like, I couldn't put it down because mm -hmm. it was like, so it's, he's so smart and such a good writer. And it's so precise about like these sort of phenomenological experiences of blindness. Like, like he's like listening to the rain. There's these really beautiful passages of like him, like talking about, how the rain like brings the landscape to light for him because you can hear like you know suddenly this sort of invisible landscape is is so vivid you know those passages are incredible but there's also he's just like so honest about his deep depression and like anger about becoming blind and you know i think to be fair to him like that's a reality of that experience but i just know so many blind people who are like that book is the necronomicon and must not be open you know because like, it just messes with your head uh, but so like Hall was definitely in my head a lot as I wrote mm -hmm. and both as like somebody to write against because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the biggest compliment I've gotten is this afternoon at lunch when Robert was like, you know, you're that, that's the book that people who are going blind should read, not Hall. I mean, sorry, your book is the book that people should read, not Hall, you know, mm -hmm. and like, and that's so why I do think I was like writing against Hall. And, and then and the other book that came to mind is Georgina Klieg um, has a book called Sight Unseen. Um, she recently retired from Cal um, 
as an English professor, and and her book is also like written from the perspective of her blindness, but then like what I tried to do, like like writing through that into film criticism and literary history, and um, her thinking has just like enriched my understanding of blindness and just like on a literary sense, like how to weave those two things together. Um, like she she has this really great line, I think from a different book, where she calls herself imperfectly blind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and just that, that to me, that phrase really captures like so much of my experience of like, sure, I'm blind, but like, I'm not really doing it quite right, whether like I've got too much vision or I don't read Braille that fast, you know, that's I, I, her work is really important mm -hmm. to me. Um, I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to, to reading that one, mm -hmm. not the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think we were at the at the point in our event where we want to open it to questions from from you all. Um, there seems to be a question right here. Yeah, I can hardly wait. <laughs> it's um, it's actually um, I'm part of a group called Safe Sight Now, and our granddaughter was born with an Usher syndrome one B. Mm. She was born profoundly deaf, mm. and uh, she has cochlear implants. And she now can hear, and she can talk, mm. and she talks. Mm -hmm. She's going to be in kindergarten, and she's talking about learning about archaeology. So we got her a book tonight about archaeology. Great. And she, her loss of her sight. So there are 400,000 children on the planet um, who have this rare syndrome. And they are, they're all profoundly deaf. They all are losing their sight. And it's all retino retinitis pigmentosa. Did mm -hmm. I say it right, honey? Pigmentosa. Okay, I'm right here with my husband. He corrects me because I say it wrong. Sure. RP. RP. Okay, my point is, so I what so what we did last night, we had a fundraiser in Petaluma because we're funding research mm -hmm. to end the blindness with retinitis pigmentosa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it right that time too. So my point is what has happened in that process of um, inviting people to this event. I've learned about adults, that's how I learned about you, mm. from other people who attended the uh, event last night, and they're here tonight. They oh, said, great. Carol, do you know about, you know, Andrew Leland? No, you got to read his book. Okay, I got your book, and here I am. And that's all within the last week and a half. So wow. thank you for being here. And I love your sense of humor. I love your, who you be. Thank you so much. <laughs> but my point is... Did you did you have a question? I do, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting there. So what I'm seeing is, would there be an interest, and I don't know if you would know that, with adults with RP to be connected with Say Sight Now when the researchers find a cure for retinitis pigmentosa that it would apply to adults as well? Okay. That's my question. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Um, it's a great question. I mean, I think, to answer briefly, uh, I got to write a piece for The New Yorker about deafblind communication that, and, 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 and basically there's this language that some linguists say is not a language, some linguists say it definitely is a language, it's the world's first attested tactile language. It's called protactile. And it emerged in communities of people with type 2 ushers okay. um, who grew up deaf and, and often grew up culturally deaf, like the signing. And then as they have RP, same thing I've got, um, and lost their sight, they lose access to ASL. And, and so it's this, it's this really profound, uh, uh, situation because they, they lose access to communication. Um, and, uh, uh, absolute genius. If you like my sense of humor, you'll love his, uh, deafblind poet named John Lee Clark is, you know, I don't know what to compare him to, but he's like, he's the, he's one of the leaders of this group and he's, he's like, uh, if you know how in England you can like bet on who's going to win a MacArthur genius, like I would put my money on that guy. Um, but but you know I'm all for I don't begrudge fundraising for cure at all. But personally, like where my excitement goes and where I put my money and where I put like my writing is to building lives, you know, and building community and building language. So like what I would do is write to John Lee Clark and say you know, I want my daughter to live the most full and connected life. And how can I do that? And then she's suddenly in this community of deafblind people who are resting agency for themselves out of the hands of interpreters who often can like really leave them feeling like they're being wheeled around and, and they don't have agency in their lives and saying like, no, we're the ones who, uh, you know, are in the driver's seat here. And I, I just, the, the time I spent on that reporting trip with these folks, these deafblind, exactly the same thing, usher type two, 
it, it was just like one of the most profound experiences of my life. They're they're incredible and they're all over the country. But you know, there's it's a tiny community too, so you have to sort of find these pockets. But like University of Chicago, there's a lot of work happening. Seattle is an epicenter. Um, but I would just say, like, I can if you email me, my email's on the website. I can connect you with John Lee Clark, and he's the he's the guy. I'll email you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other any other questions? Yes, here in the in the front. First of all, I'm sorry that I got in late. I don't know the area. I was driving around. Uh, streets ended and didn't begin. And um, <laughs> the streets I'm, ended and didn't begin. Parked, <laughs> I'm parked by a bus stop. I, I think I made it all right. I drive a Fiat. You'll be fine. But anyway, um, I happened to see the ad of uh, your appearing here at uh, perhaps the most, I wouldn't say opportune, but uh, um, I used to teach English and I'm forgetting my language. Um, serendipity. Um, I was recently uh, diagnosed with uh, cataracts. Hmm. And uh, it's gotten to the point where I'm hypersensitive to most light. Uh, I'm on a waiting list to be um, have it surgically taken care of, which scares the hell out of me. The idea of anybody cutting into my eyes is mm. just. Uh, but everyone keeps telling me, "Oh, it's nothing. You'll you'll get right through it. It's you know, it's routine." I said, "It's not routine for me. I've never had it before." Mm. And. Um, Anyway, when I when I saw that ad, I thought some sort of benevolent spirit maybe you know wanted me to read that ad and come here. Hmm. And um, right now, I'm kind of obsessed with my own sight because um, I'm I, I'm old enough to be you know to have something like this happen to me, but. Um, I just don't know. I'm I, I'm I'm sorry I'm late and um, uh, I don't think I have any questions. I just I I just wanted to share the experience of being uh, here and listening to what you have to say and um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for that comment. I mean, I think if I could answer it. Yeah, I, mean, there's, yeah, I was going to say, you, you mentioned some of that in, in the book, talking about, you know, the, the tension between, you know, you know see, right, seeing a very beautiful sunset, yeah. you know, and, and the experience of also knowing, you know, at some point that might not, um, or that will not happen. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, finding badass blind people and, like, the NFB philosophy, the National Federation of the Blind philosophy, you know, like, which argues that blindness is an incidental characteristic. It's like hair color, like you know. And and there was a there was a president of the NFB, Kenneth Jernigan, who I think you know he he, he famously said like blindness certainly is an inconvenience, but that's about it. Like you know, it, it's 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 when people don't make things accessible, right, or they 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 stigmatize or you know treat blind people with low expectations. You know, that, that's the problem. And I completely have really been transformed by, by a lot of that philosophy and a lot of the people I've met who carry it. But, you know, in the book, there's also fear and there's also mm -hmm. grief. And I think, um, you know, it's really scary. Uh, and I think, like, it's really tough to hold both of those things at the same time, even as I really, really, to, like, the, my mitochondria believe that they both are true, that, like, yeah, it's scary. Like, of course, I'm not just, like, delighted that... I'm not, I don't have vision anymore. You know, I was talking to somebody who is like a really big mocker in the blindness world. And like, he was telling me that there was a surgery that he might go for that might restore vision. And I was like, but you like, you're Mr. Blind guy. You know, he's like, <laughs> sure, I get some vision back. Great. Like, it's like, I'm not, I haven't like sat around my life waiting for it. But so that's all to say that, like, I think that I don't want to sit here and be like a motivational speaker and be like, if you went blind tomorrow, like you would be dancing through Golden Gate Park, playing the flute, like it's great, you'll be fine. But at the same time, like the reality is that like there are people in this room and there's people all over the world who can show you a way to live a life as a blind person that is um, that is full of joy and normalcy. And, and you know, as Georgina Cleave wrote, I like quote her every day on this, but you know, she wrote about her blindness, there are days that it matters less than the weather. 
and you know, I still have some vision, but I also, you know, feel blind a lot of the time. And there are days when like all the things that come along with it do just recede absolutely to the background. And so, you know, I think you're entitled to your fear and anxiety about it, but also I think if you can, like you can remember that and just look to people like those guys in the room, in the third row that like a, a really rich, full, normal, awesome life as a blind person is utterly available to you. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions? Um, let's go. I haven't gone over here. Let's go over here with you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned your wife a little. So it's your family and also your friends. Um, I'm just curious what uh, might be in the book or your experiences of the people who are supporting somebody who is going through this process. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, for myself, my husband's kind of too, great shape and all that, but he's going through this. and now realizing, oh, taking over a lot of these things and how much do I want to give him? I yeah. don't want to suddenly dominate everything. So anyway, just want to hear some of those. Thank you for that question. Um, I mean, I think like that was why it felt worth taking those risks of writing about my marriage because mm -hmm. that was something I hadn't really seen written about um, in the way that I needed. Um, and it's a really important thing and it's a really complicated thing. Um, uh, like someone told me once that when one person in a relationship loses their vision like both both members do and you know, obviously that's not literally true but there is a way in which the partner of somebody and I think this is probably true of disability more broadly like there is you have to very quickly cultivate that like a met like that the power of I guess it's compassion but also like it's not just compassion because there's like compassion feels like maybe too trite a way to say it but you have to sort of be able to think like a blind person but then I don't know. I'm like quoting a lot of Kenneth Jernigan here. I'm like an NFB guy all of a sudden. But, uh, you know, like there's this really amazing document that's on the Internet. It's called the uh, the dishwashing tape, I think. Or it's like a, like basically like Jernigan was running this blindness center and was like giving a talk to his students. And basically he talked about like having your cake and eating it, too. Like you can't um, like there's a real I think for people losing their vision, there's a there's a tendency. And I feel, feel it strongly myself where I'm like, OK, like I have no idea. This is a really dark restaurant. I have no idea where the or like the place where we put our trays is, Lily can do it so easily. I'm just going to let her do it. And then that's like a little, that there's a, there's some, that's a weed that can grow out of control, you know, where I'm just like, well, I'll just let her do this and I'll let her do that. And then, and then some of her resentment is, is earned, you know, I mean, like anybody would resent somebody like that. And, and it's tricky because it's like, I'm still figuring out how to do things as a blind person. And, and so there's, it's a really delicate negotiation. But so I guess to answer your question, I think like the compassion and the accommodation needs to be a two way street. And I, I think it's easy to fall into the situation of saying like, I mean, nothing's bigger than going blind, right? So like that person needs all the attention and they're going to be the ones, you know, and I think it really has to be like anything in a marriage or a relationship. Like there's got to be the, the communication, the recognition of like what you're going through and what your needs are and, and much easier said than done. But that's where I would start. Okay. Yeah, and kind of a follow up because you know we started going to the services like Lighthouse and yeah. stuff, and there's all these things like, oh yeah, we're gonna teach you know how to use a cane and the yeah. readers, and I'm like, do you have something for like the you know like the spouse or the caregivers? Like, is, yeah. is there some shorter programs like that too? Like, mm. Maybe yeah, I don't. I guess you go on the internet and just start googling like crazy. Yeah, I mean, I would say like. <laughs> Once you start hanging out in blind spaces, like the spouses will be around, you know. So, yeah. like, I think that's a really powerful part about community, where it's not just blind people in the community. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you go, if you spend enough time at the lighthouse, you'll meet some of those folks. Thank you. Uh, yes. I have two questions. They're very different. But I have some blind people I know. Um, just one of the most amazing people I've met, and in both cases, twins. They were blind since birth from. I sort of like to birth them being uh, too much oxygen, you know. Can you speak up a little bit? And so, okay. And so I've asked them before, and they sort of, they've heard the question too many times, but I have to help them think about it. Do you think there's a fundamental difference? I mean, there obviously are some differences fundamentally, but of someone who's essentially blind from birth, yeah. as opposed to someone who gradually goes blind and so is losing something they had, whereas these people aren't really losing something they had. Uh, if you want to talk about that one, it's, it's not really a question. But it's, yeah. um, and then the other one question I have is just very practical, maybe, is that I know also that a huge factor in some of these people's lives have been their dogs, their mm. eye dogs. And also that it's been a huge problem that they don't last very long as seeing mm. eye dogs. So it's very difficult, 
partying with them and finding a new one. But uh, do, do you want to talk about the, the option to have a dog? Have you thought about sure. that? And if you have, I'd be happy to be your dog. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Stooges song, I want to be your dog. Is that about guide dogs after all this time? Uh, <laughs> um, so your question about like, you know, to use the fancy words like congenital blindness versus adventitious blindness. Uh, yes, okay. um, I am adventitiously blind. Um, yeah, that's that's a really important distinction and one I really wrestled with in the book because it's very tempting. If not, you know, I, I can't write a book like this without just constantly saying like blind people, blah, blah, blah. Right. But like there is uh, a real difference in in that experience. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know. I think. And there's certainly like, like I think from like a cognitive science perspective, differences too, right? Because like there's there's this idea of like a blind brain, you know, versus a sighted brain, uh, you know, where like the brain actually does I think remap itself in some ways, where like like Braille readers' visual cortices are lighting up when they're reading Braille, and so like for somebody who reads Braille from a very young age, like that's going to be kind of hardwired in a way that for me it's like never going to be, and so like. I just, Robert, you're going to kill me if I keep on talking about you, but like, I will never ever, even if I just like quit everything and lock myself in a castle and read Braille all day long, I will never read Braille as quickly or as fluently as Robert does. Um, and that bums me out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that's one difference. And, you know, there's other stuff about like, I think just like growing up with this like easy access to visual grammar almost, you know, like there's this, I write a little bit in the book about a podcast called, um, talk description to me that like picks like a really wild range of subjects like everything from like the Great Wall of China to like Day of the Dead and basically it's just like they discuss like what do these things look like because I think if you're blind and you're growing up blind like people are like okay guys it's Day of the Dead today and then everybody's like cool and you like get some candy and like nobody might actually take the time to like say like what does the skeleton look like and like you know how is it painted and is it like a scary skeleton or like fun skeleton and uh it's like such a wild Sisyphean task to be like okay you have to describe the entire world, but like stuff like that is really valuable. Um, you know, but so I think for an adventitiously blind person, there's just like it's it's sort of easy to make the assumption. Like I know what Day of the Dead looks like. I know what um, what you know. So that's another right, difference. Right, right, right. Uh, the guide dog thing. Um, I don't have one, obviously, or I mean, I could have left it at home or whatever. But um, <laughs> for me, like I feel bad about. I just like you know, like when I'm on a reporting trip, I like to like leave the hotel at seven and get back at midnight and just go hard. And I would feel bad for a dog, I think. Uh, the thing that blind folks who are guard dog users have told me is that, you know, I've experienced this, especially with sleep jade training, like getting around with a cane, there's a very high cognitive demand that that requires, especially like, like you know, with, with, with less vision than I have, I think. Um, you know, just like remembering that it's two more blocks and then like, you know, oh, there's something, there's like a construction thing that confuses you and you have to go around it, you know, like, that just like when I came back from a day of, of cane travel training under sleep shoes like that, I felt like I'd just taken like seven MCATs on, layered on top of each other because <laughs> it was just like my brain was dead. You know, and with a guide dog, like, you know, if you walk between here and Lincoln um, with a cane, you're going to hit like every obstacle between here and Lincoln, right? The guide dog is going to zip you around the construction cone and zip you around the newspaper kiosk and you get there. And so, like, a friend of mine, Chancey Fleet, who's a really uh, brilliant, um, she works at the New York Public Library. Uh, she she sort of says like she can actually like daydream again you know, with a with a uh, with a guide dog. Mm -hmm. um, this will be our last question. I think we'll go over here on the second row. Yeah. Hello, Andrew. It's Tammy. Hey. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. So we have a painter friend. He lost some vision um, when he was probably about thirty-five, and I think he's doing some of his best painting now. Hmm. Honestly, he lost most of his vision, and I think people of, like Voorhees who. You know, he wrote 40 books after he was born. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering, has this process changed your creative style mm. in any way? Like, how has it sort of made your creative style evolve? Mm. Um, when I was living in San Francisco, and we were roommates, uh, <laughs> and I was working at The Believer, doing like really fun work, but not writing very much, I had a blog on wordpress.com uh, where it would just be like I would just write like absolute nonsense like true nonsense like funny weird pleasurable nonsense but like it was not 
offering anybody any value in the world except me and maybe like three friends. Um, but I loved it and like it just felt like a language nozzle that I would just like open up and like, you know, like when they open up the fire hydrants on a hot summer day and play around a little bit and close it back up. And now, uh, and then when I started to like, you know, use a cane and like blindness intruded a lot more, uh, like it felt, I felt some urgency to write about it. It wasn't just like, oh cool, now I have a subject, I get to write a book, although certainly as part of it, but I was like, oh wait, this fire hydrant actually like put out a fire. What do you know about that? Um, so like in some ways, like I still feel the same like pleasure of just like doing fun stuff with language, but like now it feels like it's got a vector that is actually uh, might be of some use certainly to me and, and also to others. Yeah, you're talking about focus kind of? Focus, but um, I don't know, like I kind of feel like I have a beat in a way that's not just like, oh cool, like a newspaper hired me to cover disability, but like, like I don't know, my dad keeps using the word mission, which I always bridle at. I'm like, I'm not on a mission, dad. But like, <laughs> uh, but it does feel like, like I feel really, really excited about mining this territory and not for like, not for cash, but for like <laughs> all the amazing stuff I'm finding, you know? And it just, it feels generative. Like I was talking to my friend, Chris Ying, who I worked with at McSweeney's, who now works for the Dave Chang Cinematic Universe, and uh, and you know we were talking. He was sort of like talking about writing about food and like how like it's sort of this infinite thing where you can like write about different cuisines or different techniques or different tools or there's like new trends or old historical stuff. And like I started to feel that way about disability a little bit, where it's like it just intersects with every conceivable part of life and it's like under researched and under discovered and uh, people have such weird false ideas about it that are really fun to explode and so yeah it just feels really generative to me awesome. yeah, great. Uh, well thank you so much Andrew um, thank you all for being here and Green Apple for for hosting us let's give Andrew a thank you Andrew and Green Apple For <laughs> um, thank you all so much for joining us. This was a real treat. Um, and thank you for joining us both in person and online. Uh, so if, if you've been here before, we're actually going to do our signing line a little bit uh, different this evening. I'm going to have the books available next to Andrew up here as opposed to at the register. Um, so if you want to line up uh, right where I am um, on your left and, or nope, my left, uh, <laughs> then uh, you can stand right here and we'll just give me one moment while we adjust things. Uh, and we just ask that you purchase the books before you leave the store, but <laughs> Andrew can certainly sign them before you purchase them. Uh, if you need to know where else to go, uh, yeah, you can sell them outside. Um, uh, but if you need to know where else to go, feel free to ask me. And if not, we'll see you next time. Thank you so kindly. Thank you.